session is recorded um, and we will kick start right now. So kia ora koutou, no mai haere mai, ko Erika Austin toko ingua. We will be opening the session today with a karakia as we transition the energy of the virtual space into our formal session. A karakia is a non-religious blessing and is the practice of our indigenous people of Aotearoa, New Zealand, the Maori people. So here we go. E te hui, whai a te matauranga ki marama, ki a whai a te take ngā mahi katoa, tu maia, tu kaha, aroha atu, aroha mai, tato ia, tato katoa. Greetings to you all. My name is Erica Austin, EHF's uh, community activator and the host for the session. The Edmund Hillary Fellowship EHF is a community of 500 plus innovators, entrepreneurs and investors committed to Aotearoa New Zealand as the base camp for global impact. Our vision is that Aotearoa New Zealand inspires global leadership and solutions for future generations, built on the principles of tangata tiriti and values of Sir Edmund Hillary. In this session, we will hear from fellow um, Amaret uh, Charoan Fun, aka AIM, on bridging impact tech between New Zealand and Southeast Asia. First, just some quick housekeeping. The session is being recorded and will be listed on the EHF uh, website afterwards. So um, in the meantime, please stay muted, but feel free to put in your questions in the chat box as we go through. And I will read these out for AIM as um, the corridor conversation unfolds. And some of you may leave at um, various times and that is okay too. So just a little bit about AIM. Um, uh, AIM is a Thai angel investor, advisor, and founding board member of the Thailand Business Angel Network, the largest angel investment association in Thailand, where he is the vice president of Thailand Ecosystem Development. Through his investment holding and innovation advisory company, AIM Ventures, the various other uh, and a various other angel um, syndicates, he has invested in more than 40 startups and funds combined. He has over a decade of experience in the technology startup ecosystem as he works to support the next generation of startups and ecosystem innov innovatives um, and also um, in the emerging uh, industry verticals such as climate tech, health and well-being, food and agriculture, space tech, Web3 as well as Web2. Aim passion for the startup community and to help entrepreneurs grow he has actively coached over 1,000 startup founders, that's impressive, 1,000 plus over the past decade. Because of his impact on the Thai uh, startup ecosystem, he was recognized as an Obama Foundation Asia Pacific leader, is of course a, um, a fellow of um, Edmund Hillary Fellowship and has been named one of Forbes Asia 30 under 30 Enterprise Technology and Thailand Startup Enabler of the Year in 2016. I had the privilege of meeting AIM for the first time as part of Asia New Zealand Foundation Leadership Network when he first came over to attend the Social Enterprise World Forum in 2017, followed by EHF's New Frontiers event. I am so honoured to be hosting the session and thank you so much, AIM, for your time. Um, just to really uh, kick us off, um, tell us more about you as a person, your journey and how you got into all of this impressive portfolio. Thank you. Wow, so many familiar faces. Um, I'm going to try to throw a couple of curveball, Jeffrey, Todd, Larry, uh, Rosalie, and everybody else, <laughs> Hayden. Um, how did I get all involved in that? And, uh, I have to give credit where credit is due. Uh, that would be uh, Hayden Montgomery on this call. Um, he reached out to me, called LinkedIn message, and said, uh, I should go to New Zealand to check out the scene. I've never heard of uh, the Asia New Zealand Foundation. I've never thought of going to New Zealand, but the prospect of a, a free trip uh, to a very beautiful place uh, on earth, I said, uh, well, why not? I decided to sign up uh, with no expectation, uh, but came here and fell in love with the people, the land, and just the the camaraderie of, of both the cohort that I was in, a lot of uh, Southeast Asian entrepreneurs, they became lifelong friends, and also a lot of the friends when we met on the trip. And I said, um, I'd really wanted to uh, come back and do more uh, and, and have that thought in my mind for a couple of years. 
until uh, an at another conference. Uh, that is when I'm, uh, somebody told me about the, the Edmund Hiller Fellowship. Uh, it was the first call. I said, you know what? I got lucky once. I might get lucky again. So uh, uh, try as I might, I applied um, uh, for the for the first uh, first batch and and got in. And also again, not expecting that the, the Edmund Hillary Fellowship will will change my life. But uh, I've always been uh, somebody who has really uh, just kind of follow my gut and then felt felt that um, a calling and pull and just really sensing the vibe and said. Uh, even uh, about uh, 13 years ago, uh, before social entrepreneurship or impact tech was was cool, uh, I actually had this this calling that uh, I was uh, doing a degree in accounting, uh, and and actually uh, barely uh, passing uh, uni, uh, and had a had a sense back at th at that time that this wasn't what I was supposed to be doing. Was what not really what I saw myself to be uh, accountant going to the big four, uh, getting a job, uh, quitting and starting something, um, and I set out on a personal journey of self discovery. Did a lot of volunteer work and twenty odd internships later, I had the chance to have an epiphany, uh, in the hill tribes. Uh, north of, of Thailand, uh, close to the uh, Burmese border, uh, working working with the land, working with the indigenous um, people there. Uh, felt really incredible for two weeks uh, on a high of, of having felt um, useful, felt privileged, felt uh, living um, simply but happily and coming, crashing down depressed. Having realized that that two weeks, uh, was was an incredible life changing experience, but that I have not changed anybody's life, up at the hill tribes to a village I'll never visit again, um, came down from the mountains and said, you know how can I marry this, a incredible experience of of service and impact and social work, with what I really wanted to do, which is entrepreneurship. So I uh, discovered my first job uh, Googling uh, the word social enterprise and finding the one and only nonprofit then in Thailand that was building a social enterprise uh, incubator uh, called Change Fusion. And that started my whole journey into this space. So, so EHF was, I always say, was actually uh, a calling for me to get back into the sector after uh, hanging out with uh, the likes of Todd, trying to change the world to technology and innovation um, for a while. I uh, got a bit distracted with uh, trying to build uh, Thailand's largest co-working space chain and having lived through uh, WeWork. Uh, fingers crossed that they, they stick around. Uh, I know a lot of people are still working out of WeWork um, and they love it, but uh, uh, having realized that uh, Technology um, without empathy uh, minus uh, humanity was was not the the formula for for the the world that I, I wished uh, to live in. So mm -hmm. actually, you know, uh, it's just like Alcalo and the Alchemist. We we got a little lost. We walked around, wandered the earth, and came back to the same spot where we started uh, thirteen years in. So uh, thanks for having me today, Erica. Yeah, and um, I, I always say that, you know, and always believe that if we're intentional and know our purpose, everything will align. And it sounds like everything has aligned really well for you and, and for that calling um, to emerge. So um, you talked a little bit about, you know, social enterprise and um, the entrepreneurship journey. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about what we, you mean by impact tech? Awesome, yes. Um, well, I, I think it, it came from this, uh, discovery uh, after being in the sector for so long that um, we had a lot of words uh, imperfect to describe a lot of the activities that we do. So, so I, I said a lot of word of a social enterprise um, earlier, uh, but after 10 years in the sector, um, I could 
count only in Thailand with one hand social entrepreneurs who stuck with it for the past decade and were moderately successful. Uh, and a lot of folks uh, fell by the wayside. Um, mm. uh, and obviously that, uh, I think words don't define us, but sometimes we get labeled um, in things that are, uh, um, you know, uh, a challenge, um, in, not in service of the mission. And in Thailand, what, what had happened was the word uh, social enterprise or SE was sometimes viewed as as an entrepreneur who was less committed to the business side of the venture, but more of the impact side and had um, really, uh, you know, uh, a strong passion and an activist heart that was struggling to make the uh, venture um, and the impact of that venture quite scalable. Uh, and, and in the community that had uh, shaded a lens uh, where a traditional and more uh, kind of uh, progressive growth oriented Im impact investors would, would find it challenging to engage. Well, at the same time, uh, more philanthropic or um, NGO, nonprofit uh, uh, supporters or uh, uh, investors were also um, uh, really vigilant about how social enterprises operate and what they mm. could do and could not do. And it got to the point where, where the discussion was uh, becoming a bit unproductive, where uh, the, the ventures had to, you know, prove, really cut, you know, cut their wrists and show that they bled impact uh, through and through, uh, while at the same time, they had to, you know, figure their, their business out on their own, because if they were too commercial, they were selling out the division, or they, they could, wouldn't, 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 shouldn't work with this corporate and that corporate. Uh, so the whole community, after a decade, uh, a lot of us said, uh, can we really find uh, a different uh, genre of, of the work that we do in a lens that was more inclusive and not creating kind of a, an echo chamber and bubble. So uh, with my friends in, in Korea and, 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 and a lot of ecosystem builders uh, through this um, online accelerator uh, impact collective, which um, I, I worked with during the pandemic, uh, we ran a couple of cohorts uh, trying to uh, incubate about a hundred um, impact entrepreneurs uh, virtually uh, through the help of two thousand mentors and supporters. So, in a, in a way, uh, taking a an EHF light approach, but putting it all on on the, uh, you know, the cyber space. Um, we def this decided to to use the word impact tech, uh, to emphasize uh, our you know, consistent belief in, in creating an impact. But sometimes when you, you put the, uh, you know, the suffix tech on, on anything, there there is a uh, implication that this thing should, you know, this venture should uh, aspire to be more efficient, more leaner, more energetic and aggressive in, in pursuing its plan and growth. Uh, so, we, we stuck with it and and uh, for a lot of the ventures that I uh, plan to uh, invest in, um, it's not just an impact. I have a portfolio of SMEs and I'm looking at starting an international preschool. Uh, there's a lot of uh, traditional tech startups, but uh, where the heart really lies um, is, is impact tech. Amazing. And, and while you're doing all of this, um, you touched on ecosystem development. So what, what is the key to ecosystem development? And from your experience and learning from your engagements in Thailand, how do we best build connections between New Zealand and the Southeast Asia ecosystem? Can you give us some like really tangible examples about this development and how you go about it? Sure, sure. This is a quite, quite a big question. Um, uh, you know, definitely, uh, if I say anything wrong, there's a lot of people in this call who are uh, bigger experts than me, like like Jeffrey and and, and Todd and uh, Emily. Uh, but but I guess uh, ecosystem development is is really the art of 
building the the market that we wish uh, to see to support all the ideas and projects uh, that we wish to either start or invest in uh, so that you know the you know, uh, all tide uh, the all all boats are lifted when the tide rises um, and that that was my first role uh, in uh, technology in, in 2010. I realized that I, I want to start an app. Uh, right, right now, the, the Bangkok governor uh, is trying to build a super app uh, for us, the city. Uh, basically, you can, uh, you know, book any of the government services, ask for data uh, for anything, and 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 really just pay for for your bills and whatnot. Uh, I had the same idea in uh, 29, uh, 2010. And I, I realized that uh, not only did I not know anything about building apps, this idea would not fly very well with the governor back then because he, you know, it would be an app to tell him how badly he is failing at his job. Um, but you see, uh, we, we are pioneers. So uh, I saw the market coming 13, 13 years early. But I said, okay, well, wait a minute. Before I start this app, um, I don't even know if it's a good idea. I don't even know how to build a, a tech company. Uh, how would people build build startups uh, back in the days? Uh, so we did some some homework and research and, and that then stumbled a couple upon a couple of uh, articles on, on TechCrunch and uh, blogs by Paul Graham at Y Combinator uh, who said that, you know, the, uh, the best entrepreneurs, they start in communities. If, if they can't think of anything, first thing they, they do is they, they go to find people who know what they're doing and then figure out where they hang out. It could be in meetups, it could be in cafe, there were co-working spaces. Um, I, I went to a couple of meetups. Uh, I like the vibe. Um, you know, the cafes were were annoyingly expensive back in the days. This was uh 3G um days where you couldn't stream on, on YouTube. Um uh, and and I said, well, uh, co-working spaces was was booming, uh, but none had, had arrived in, in Thailand. So so I would start by starting the space and then I will figure out um, from meeting a lot of smart people how to build the app. And, uh, you know, from there, maybe I'll meet the governor and I'll pitch him this idea. So, so I never got to step two and three of my, uh, you know, grand plans to, to conquer the Thai civic tech sector. But through that, um, I, I realized the the importance of the work that everybody in this call is doing, which is uh, we all see some parts of the, the business um, and uh, impact environment um, as, as lacking. Uh, and we feel that if somebody had done something about it, all of us would be so much better. And then we just said we couldn't wait for uh, anybody to do it anymore. So we'll just kind of roll our sleeves up and and build a part of the the market that we wish existed and would benefit everyone. So that's kind of the way I view fundamentally of, of ecosystem. It's it's um you know you win I win we all win. It's virtuous. It's what Rosalie is doing. It's what all of us here I think showed up because we we are doing it in some way. And actually, there's a few projects in this room. Uh, that we are continuing to doing and then starting new ones to say, uh, we want to build that ecosystem. Now to your second part of your question, New Zealand and Southeast Asia. I, I've been to, there's been a couple of articles circulating that uh, the New Zealand tech ecosystem or, or impact um, could do with a lot of work. And having been been recently there uh, last month firsthand just to to reconnect with um, my fellow EHF and, and at the mission studio, I realized that um, the work continues, uh, you know, perpetually forever. <laughs> and um, I'm very excited uh, because uh, I, I went also there for not just mission studio, there's this thing called the uh, uh, New Zealand uh, Trade and Enterprise and the uh, Thai uh, the New Zealand Embassy in, in Thailand, and we went to do a, a Thai economic and market update. And actually, uh, 
there there's an update in Singapore and Vietnam, and most most TV um, entrepreneurs would not realize that trade between New Zealand and and Southeast Asia has, has never been better. The region's growing uh, rapidly. Uh, pre pandemic, Thailand was the largest source uh, for New Zealand education, and um, the number one off peak uh, season tourism market. Um, for for Kiwis, uh, and exports growing eight uh, percent annually. Uh, uh, part of that was because uh, for a lot of people that might not know, there's actually an ASEAN Australia New Zealand free trade agreement. Um, so, uh, you know, there's there's already a lot of connectivity, but maybe a lot of folks have not either one had the chance to visit, two hadn't really figure out. Where are some of the opportunities? Have have never really had a good sit down with uh, a couple of uh, you know local entrepreneurs, local ecosystem builders to see where are some of the the gaps, where are some of the trade winds and opportunity. Uh, here we have um, you know the some interesting stats that uh, beef exporters were having uh, a bumper year in in. Uh, uh, Thailand, uh, going from two hundred fifty million dollars worth of beef, uh, in twenty twenty two, up from one thirteen in twenty nineteen. So that's almost double the size in in two three years. Uh, and wine, renewable energy. I was with the gentleman who was building electric uh ferries, uh, on on a panel and and design in New Zealand and already attracting Thai investors and customers. So, so I think, um, how do we do that? Uh, definitely shared values um, is, is often number one, the, the reason for people to congregate. If we don't believe and agree on something, then there's no reason for us to meet each other. And, and I think uh, Asia New Zealand Foundation has done an incredible job for that. And I recommend everybody in this call, if there's a chance, uh, to uh, be a part of that other network because that number one shared value of of uh, the, the Asian New Zealand Foundation is do you believe that Asia represents like a generational once in a lifetime opportunity for New Zealand to to connect with the people, the culture and the business opportunity uh, and if it's a yes, then you should meet more uh, and make more, more Asian friends. And, and in, in that network, you will have friends from everywhere. Um, and, and obviously, you know, the world is a big place. I was in uh, Vienna, uh, Azerbaijan, uh, and then New Zealand, headed to Dubai, headed to uh, uh, Warsaw. And I think we all can fall in love with every country in the world. Um, I think there's something beautiful about the people, the food, the culture everywhere. Uh, but uh, at some point, I think the world is a very big place. So uh, all of us need to find a reason, a story, why certain geography uh, draws us there and, and matters more. And for a lot of ventures, um, Southeast Asia or, or Asia would be a great place to have a lot of impact. Uh, there's a lot of interesting people doing uh, ocean cleanup and plastics uh, because a lot of uh, ocean waste is uh, originating from the region. There's a, a lot of uh, issue around on food and ag. Um, you know, uh, half of the world lives in that little small circle, but uh, most of the country in, in Southeast Asia are also uh, globally net food exporters. Um, and they can improve their agricultural practices uh, with New Zealand help. So I think shared values uh, is number one. And then proximity. Uh, we're close yet far. Um, I had a chance to meet a couple of ed, ed tech companies. I, I had a chance to talk to Zero and Allbirds back in the days um, for five, six, seven, ten 10 years. Uh, and I've been preaching to the team, please, please come to Asia. Please come to Thailand. I will roll out the red carpet. I'll do whatever it takes. Just, uh, you know, let me help you. Um, and the founders were very polite. And they said, uh, you know, they have this bigger puzzle to crack in the U.S. 
and Europe. And yes, I, I have heard of many founders say like, go to America first. Uh, it's big. You'll get really big really quickly. It's the toughest market. So it's the most challenging. Take a crack at it. Uh, and I think they're right uh, in some ways. And I think that's a well-trodden path. But then now I actually found one company, the EdTech company, said, we've already cracked the US and the Euro Europe market. Where next? Asia. So um, I don't mind if we're uh, third in the list of priorities, but eventually folks come around to it. I don't mind if it's first in the party and said, you know, uh, I think we are our biggest customers are actually uh, ringing us from from the region. Um, but uh, I think we are close, uh, closer than you realized. Uh, we are uh, in an abundant amount of entrepreneurs willing to take you there. And I think the uh, the, the key, the, the work that I still need to do uh, and, and ecosystems uh, need to continue is to how to make that uh, seamless and easy. I had a had a chance to support a Kiwi founder who was trying to bring a very important uh, hospital management uh, solution to Thailand. Uh, we set him up with the office. We had his team. He's hired 10 staff. Uh, fortunately, he had some issues with his co-founder and then uh, he had to back out. But uh, there was only, of, of, the t of the past decade, there was one guy uh, who I, I really had a chance to help. And he said, his business was doing great. Everybody loved his product. Um, and he was just getting started. Uh, and, you know, uh, time was cut short. But if he had stuck with it, uh, if he had continued, you know, to, to pass the company on rather than uh, retreat and say, okay, uh, let's find some local partners. Let's carry on the torch um, and, and embrace uh, the craziness of Asia, the, the energy, uh, the lack of green space and, and work life in balance. But, you know, you're going to, sprint for a couple of years, um, make a lot of impact, have a lot of fun, uh, embrace the, the madness, embrace the chaos, then I think um, his business was have done really, really well. So um, yeah, I, I think uh, that's why I'm, I'm gonna keep coming back to New Zealand to, to be closer to the founders, to really, you know, just uh, put, put Asia on top of mind. And uh, hopefully for some of you are already uh, connected and coming over so so I'm definitely preaching to the choir but um, definitely more to be done thank you for that and um, again thank you for being the connector between New Zealand and Southeast Asia and we've got a question from um, Jeffrey who has submitted um, uh, prior to the session is how do we best leverage Southeast Asia and what are some of the currently you know existing opportunities um, out there right now Sure. Well, I, I guess the basic way to start um, is to really seriously view it as uh, not a backwater in cer certain fronts, but also as a leader and a pioneer in others. So once we establish, you say that there is a tremendous, you know, uh, for, for climate tech, $1.5 billion sitting in, in uh, Southeast Asia, that is waiting to be deployed. A lot of it is in Singapore um, and that those are sophisticated family offices, multinational conglomerates, nonprofits, and they are looking for the best technology anywhere uh, with an application for obviously scaling in the region because you know the region has a lot of problems, but not limited to that. Uh, then I think it, it makes sense to say, you know, that your investors, your philanthropic donors, your partners uh, can can open a lot of doors and, and, and encourage you, nudge you uh, to take this region seriously. I think that could be a great start. Uh, Rosalie mentioned it, that there, there could be some investor delegates from here with some founders to go over across the region to say, let's have a, you know, get a lay of the land. 
co-invest in some projects, co-invest in some funds. I think Global from day one with Shintaka is a good example. Uh, I, you know, Kiwi, uh, I think that was Taiwanese uh, uh, kind of uh, investors, uh, government or, and otherwise uh, back in the days. And, you know, uh, Shintaka being Sri Lankan, so very, very eager always to, uh, as a Kiwi uh, VC, to, to uh, engage with the region. So uh, with that, um, capital is, is like the low hanging fruit, it benefits um, the region tremendously because we now get a chance to have the founders uh, motivated to be involved in the region. But, uh, you know, one of the great uh, accelerator programs that I work with uh, is actually called the German Accelerator. And every three months, there's about 10 founders uh, that sign up for the Southeast Asia program. And the German Accelerator is government funded and helps the Germans to uh, land and figure out to come to Singapore, uh, meet a lot of great mentors, there's four or 500 folks in this WhatsApp group, I think. And and figure out if the business is right for the region. And we work, uh, I work closely uh, with about one to three companies every quarter to really dig in, to talk to people, to uh, open a couple of doors to potential customers, to host them in, in on market, to help folks set up their offices. So I, I think that that sort of program um, is needed and then and, and uh, the mantle it doesn't have to be uh, another you know kiwi landing head it doesn't have to be a physical location it can be parked with a, a local player um in the region but the the network already exists with it with uh, ehf um and i keep telling well like, they should be uh you know at, at every stage in our, our journey base camp zero is uh you know new zealand so we start there, we work on, on stuff and, and we see if it works. Uh, so where's base camp one, base camp two, three, four? And I say, well, I've signed up base camp one to be Bangkok um, uh, because uh, the, you know, the UN regional office is in Bangkok. You have USAID in Bangkok. You have some of the largest nonprofits um, headquartered there. And, and uh, you know, there there is already... Uh, my infrastructure and an existing network for people to plug into. And then lastly is, is to respect the market and, and believe that, yes, it's annoyingly hard. Um, Southeast Asia has six countries uh, out of 11 um, that, that are the largest economy in Indonesia uh, being, you know, 20,000 uh, odd islands, uh, Philippines. Um, uh, Vietnam growing at seven eight percent. Uh, Thailand second largest economy, but we have to get our politics uh right. Uh, fingers crossed. Uh, uh, ex prime minister in exile is coming back in a day, uh, and uh, we have no idea what what's gonna happen from there. But uh, 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 but but if you crack that code of landing in Singapore. Finding great engineering talent in Vietnam, expanding to Thailand because it's quite relatively easy and open to foreign direct investment, taking a crack at Indonesia, Philippines, super hard, super populous, 300 million people market. And then, you know, eventually uh, it's training wheels to uh, the great, uh, even harder mode of, of Asia to, to take a crack at India and China and basically you you know try to conquer a, a half of the population of the world uh, and, and that is already a life's work so if, if you believe that the market is as an aggregate um, hard problem that if you can beat it you would have created a very valuable company and and you've already done the US or Europe market in the past. So if you already conquered that, then you know uh Asia is is waiting at your doorstep.
Felda aim and I, I hope that um, answers your question Larry in the chat and also Rosalie's. Um, we've got a two-part question uh, from Emmeline. What other existing organizations like Asian New Zealand Foundation should organizations businesses collaborate with to strengthen partnerships or find opportunities to connect? And the second part is slightly political question. Is China considered an Asia market to collaborate with and what are the challenges? What is New Zealand's position, maybe for others in the call, in business collaboration in general? Yeah. Wow, <clears throat> big, big one. Um, uh, definitely other folks can can chime in. Uh, I know Jeffrey has a lot of op opinions. Uh, I'll answer the second one first, um, because it's much uh easier. I I think um if if you ever been to China. Uh, many many times uh things are just so crazy so advanced so nuanced it's kind of its own little ecosystem so the entrepreneurs there uh fight tooth and nail because uh it, you know in in any idea let's say in thailand you probably have two three major competitors uh out of 10 to 20 that are like the two or three and a half decent i think in china you have like tens of thousands of folks doing the same thing uh, and and they 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 don't go they don't sleep uh, they, they don't go home they, they uh, folks work their butts off so it really brings out uh, the best um, or or you know the toughest uh, in in everybody so I think from from a Southeast Asia perspective of Thailand we we look to China for for investment, for mentorship, uh, uh, market maybe for uh, to to be acquired or to do joint ventures with yes, but but to take uh, an existing project from from Thailand into China, uh, we will be selling a lot of durings. I think we've sold um a couple billions more, uh, and there's a now a freight train that links uh, Thailand to China. So that's been going really well. Uh, but but for, for certain ventures in tech, uh, it, it, it may require uh, some, uh, some of your uh, networks and experts to, to really you know, give you a lay of the land. Uh, I think a good example would be like, like Tesla, um, you know, having a foothold in the Chinese market and then getting knocked around heavily, uh, fighting with the BYD, um, losing their crown, uh, and obviously the Ch and a Chinese company winning, uh, but still having a chance and access to that market. Whereas the likes of Toyota or Volkswagen, they need to do a joint venture uh, locally to learn about how to build better EVs. Or with the Toyota's case, they actually just take a, a BYD, a local company, and reskin the car. So actually learning from the Chinese how to build better electric vehicles. So so I think that's how advanced uh, certain things are uh, in China. But it's definitely, um, in Thailand, 15% uh, of trade goes to the U.S., a little bit less, like 14.5% goes to China. So we are, you know, uh, always at the crossroads of, of superpowers. And and luckily, we're, you know, we don't share an immediate border with China. So we're a little bit, uh, a little bit off to the side. You know, the South China Sea doesn't bother us. So we're best friends with China, best friends with the States, incredible position um and and connected to to india and and five six of 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 uh, the rest of the countries in southeast asia so ev like uh, i say in every call like every country in southeast asia say it's the middle of southeast asia thailand really believes that um we we, we are about to uh, be even more strategic because they're going to cut uh the southern tip of thailand to create this called so-called land bridge which is like the panama canal uh as a second route for the straits of malacca so uh you know so much trade passed through the straits of malacca that goes through singapore and indonesia uh and and for geopolitics uh thailand is going to be even more important um so yeah uh 
it's good to be in a country that, that pl uh, plays every side as well. And, and we've done that uh, since uh, forever and never has ever colonized. So for other organizations, I think Emily asked this one, that are um, good to plug in. Uh, I, I'm part of the chamber. I, I hang out with NZTE and, and the embassy, and I know they're trying really hard to do a lot of things, but, but government has its limitation. Asian New Zealand Foundation tries really hard, but, you know, uh, as as with nonprofits, we can always do more with more money, um, and resources. Uh, I think one doesn't perfectly exist. Uh, for uh, market expansion, uh, focusing for, or let's say you know New Zealand and Australia to to the rest of Asia. Perhaps that's uh, you know that's a gap waiting to be filled. Um, you know maybe it's the the EHF, uh, you know, Southeast Asia uh, launch pad or something, you know, um, uh, I kind of throw it out there to the universe to say, I, I wish uh, that exists. I, I wish to be a part of that. Uh, but uh, the, the, the chambers are nice, but uh, has has not cut it. Um, I, I think there, there needs to be one that's more shared values towards uh, impact and and sustainability and things that we care about or or web3 or uh you know making sure that a lot of great technologies that will change the world like gen ai will not uh you know go by the wayside and and be net negative for for humanity um so uh you know every now and again um even after my my co-working space uh went through its peak and uh, we we were badly affected by the pandemic, and um, I told um a, a few folks in this call, I never want to do another co working space again. This is uh, it's giving me PTSD. Todd's nodding, like uh, you know, it's like the joke that Elon said, how how to become a millionaire, uh, become a billionaire, and then buy Twitter. Uh, it's the same with co working space. We become a a billionaire and start a co-working space and then lose all your money. Uh, but, you know, I, I guess the, the ecosystem has found me. So uh, this year, I've already been approached twice to say, let's uh, let's bring the band back. Let's start another space because people miss working in proximity with other incredible people. Uh, and there might be a, a, one, a new one coming back in Bangkok early next year. Fingers crossed. Yeah, um, we've got a few more minutes. I will jump to Paula's question and then we might have some time to open up um, the mic if anyone else has any questions. Um, Paula is asking, what was the most unexpected connection or highlight has happened for you as an EHF fellow or as part of this um, bigger whānau community? Wow. Um, that is... Every every day is a, is a gift and blessing. Um, uh, I could say that, uh, you know, uh, so many uh, some examples here. Uh, like like, uh, Emmeline is is a blessing because I never thought of getting into space tech, but hanging out with her, learning with her, I had a very weird chance. Somehow the Japanese government thought I was a very knowledgeable investor. So I must know something about space tech. And these folks at the Japanese space agency said, uh, you should come on a panel and talk and do a keynote. And I'm like, okay, sure, why not? And I, I ran Im immediately to Emily and said, I know nothing about space tech. Please give me a crash course. Uh, she sent me a couple of resources, uh, and then I really just absorbed, you know, becoming a, a sponge overnight, um, reading a bunch of blogs and, and podcasts. And said, okay, I think I know a thing or two. And I went on stage, uh, and four years later, the, the government, the Japanese government has, has uh, never realized I was an imposter. Uh, but I did always tell them I, I'm, I'm, I'm really like, you know, I'm just really winging, and they're like, it's okay. No, nobody else cares about space tech in Thailand. 
And thanks to Emily. And then Jeffrey, we, we built um, conferences. He was bringing a bunch of Taiwanese delegation over. Uh, and then I realized he was moving back home to uh, put his uh, kids to school in Christchurch. And, uh, you know, we have all this uh, meetups uh, whenever I'm in there. And then he's giving me a, a lay of the land, a very honest look about the market. Uh, and then Todd was uh, another blessing I... I met him in uh of all places in some re crazy retreat uh in I think Gilier and in, in Lombok uh in Indonesia for ecos burnt out ecosystem leaders. It was called a decelerator. We were there to not work and, and we had to do four hours of workshop and mostly dives, massage, eat great food. Um and I hope hopefully I didn't snore too much because we were roommates, but uh we probably one of the most um uh, memorable uh uh retreats and experience and then and obviously Larry meeting Lee, recently Paula uh, and everybody else that that have have been haven't mentioned Rosalie but uh yeah that's the power of uh, ecosystems you share some values you show up uh, a lot of folks become lifelong friends um so uh, you know, ever everything is is um, an interesting uh, journey and a side quest, and and you know we hopefully we will do a Tahiti uh, retreat pretty soon next year. Uh, if everybody wants to know more about it, talk to Larry. We're all in this call going to go to Tahiti, not Bora Bora because it's overpriced, uh, and we're gonna go work out there and and figure out how to change the world from uh, one paradise to another. Amazing. Um, does anyone else have any questions? You can put up your hand and you can unmute yourself. Um, you, and in the meantime, um, I'm just really curious. Um, you talked about the accelerator. Um, how do you look after <laughs> yourself being being such a, you know, ecosystem driven outwards relationship sort of weaver? Like, how do you find time for yourself? Uh, it took a long time um, because I was definitely uh, extremely full FOMO. You know, let's pass 200 name cards at a networking event. Let's meet every every speaker in my show. Um, and I need to be everywhere to be relevant. I need to be speaking on stage every week. Um, I went from being that guy to the pandemic. And I said, you know, this is just sustainable as every every day uh, my if my mission is to serve everybody i keep adding more to the to-do list pile and then diluting the you know the priority folks the people that really matter in my life that was myself and my family and some of the projects i really care about so during the pandemic it was a big reset i said um everybody asked me i was like hey, you must have like eight to 10 meetings a day, which in the past, now I said, uh, this is unsustainable. A lot of these meetings were uh, going nowhere. Um, you know, it's just helping a lot of people. The, the, the most common one I get asked for is, uh, Aim, can you give me a deep dive into the Thai startup ecosystem? <laughs> Not this, this call, this call is important. For EHF and, and New Zealand, it's priority. And I said, no, no, I cannot do any more of these meetings. It's too much. So I had to figure out a way to scale myself. Uh, so I basically dumped everything on blogs and Zoom calls. And I said, if people needed to, you know, find out about me, about Thailand and, and whatever, they can read about it. They can watch it and come to me with a couple of questions. I had a no meeting rule. So I said, I delete all meetings. And all you need to do is email me the questions or send me a voice note send me a clip while well, I'm in the bus or in the toilet, I'll get back to you. And uh, that way, yeah, I went from eight meetings to almost no meetings a day. Every meeting had to pass the threshold of like, would this get close closer for me to my goal? Is this somebody I really care about um, and going to spend my valuable life with? Uh, if yes, then it's on. If not, I find every way imaginable to avoid it uh, respectfully. Um, and then I, with all that free time, as, as Steve Jobs would say, 
you know, your job is to be creative and to uh, pace yourself to have that energy and space to create and not just be reactive to every email. And I said, okay, now that I have, I've cleared up all my agenda and subscribed to every mail, uh, you know, figured out ways to outsource all my FOMO. Um, the way I did that was, was not looking back, it's now ingenious, but actually uh, it was also even more hard work is I then became a coach and mentor and advisor to new uh, community leaders. So right now I advise eight conferences after stopping to run my own 20,000 person show. And through them, I network. So they go out there and, and attract the speakers and know everybody. And when, they, when I need to know somebody, I said, well, I don't know much about folks anymore, but I know this person who knows this person. Um, so that's how I operate now. Uh, and then that means I don't go to meetups. Uh, if I'm not speaking, if I'm not contributing in a great way or uh, being you know, particularly interested um, I don't, I don't show up, not because I'm, you know, being snobbish. It's just because I, uh, I, I, I have to go to the ones that matter. So once I got all that time back, so what do I do now? So I have this call, I'll go for a run, a bit of meditation, a bit of yoga, maybe. Um, I have uh, a game plan on being a digital renaissance man or woman. Uh, and that means, uh, being, you know, uh, financially lit, as they say, to be able to do uh, only the work that interests me and, and, and then being very physically fit. Uh, and to tonight, um, I got home at nine last night, uh, went to bed around midnight, got up this call at six. I'm already feeling it. Uh, it wasn't the best sleep ever. So now I monitor my sleep every day and to be in peak performance is to sleep really well. Uh, and, and then that also means, uh, uh, you know, exploring fasting and, 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 and whatnot. So, uh, you know, I, I don't want to sound like a new age uh, hippie, but uh, to really run this, this marathon, um, the, the pandemic has, has done me wonders to, to reset how I, I operate and no, no, no longer uh, the guy to be at the bar. And, uh, you know, the, the, the mark of pride for an ecosystem builder is to be the, the first person to show up and the last person to leave, you know, clean up the venue, with the, the organizers. Uh, that's not me anymore. Uh, but uh, that, that also means I have uh, more energy and time for, for, for this call and for everybody else that really needs it. Yeah, let's change that narrative of what, you know, we expect an ecosystem developer to, to be. Um, I did see a hand up. Um, did you still want to ask that question? If you want, yeah, just unmute. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, so I wanted to ask a question, but my co-founder put it in the chat. So we are, I'm going to ask it a little bit more elaborate than that, I guess. So my co-founder and I are from Chile, uh, in South America. And uh, I'm living now in New Zealand. That's why we're in this call and we are part of um, Jeffrey's program, the founder catalyst, very helpful. Now, a while ago, our companies in the housing tech and the prop tech, um, we're trying to solve a sort of a market failure that exists, which is, you know, people don't naturally buy sustainable housing. So a while ago, when, we, when I was developing this concept that led to this app, um, we thought about, Asia as a really good target because most houses are not being built in Europe or the US. Um, now, what everyone told me is you don't get to just go into Southeast Asia being a Chilean guy living in New Zealand. <laughs> so um, how how welcoming are of companies like ours or others like that? Wow. Well, you know, there's a bunch of... Uh... But there's a very famous uh, Colombian guy, not not so close to Chile, but close enough, uh, who just showed up because he was doing this degree and then, uh, uh, you know, wanted to explore Southeast Asia, came to Lazada in Singapore, liked it, moved to the Thai office, uh, built some software, got bored, started a developer agency, 
Um, so with zero contacts in the market, now it leads a team of 150 people and multiply that story by, you know, millions. I think in Bangkok alone is probably, uh, you know, a plus minus four, four million um, uh, foreigners uh, to be something is, is in Bangkok and, and four across Thailand. A lot of them are in Koh Phangan, a lot of Web3 digital nomad people trying to build um, interesting stuff. A lot of people in Chiang Mai. Uh, five of ten cities uh, of the digital nomad capital in the world are always um, Thai. Phuket, Chiang Mai, Bangkok, and some other Samui. Uh, Bali, obviously, in there. Da Nang, uh, uh, always uh, competing. Uh, but that means uh, come because it's a great place to live, uh, like in New Zealand. Stay because it's a great place to do business, build a team, raise funding, uh, and connect with your target market. Uh, and to do that is is a tax-free uh, incorporation um, structure called the Board of Investment. You can wholly own 100% your company. It takes about three to six months to apply for. Uh, allows you to grant work visas to yourself. Uh, they're always looking for innovative high-tech companies to come over. Um, so we can sort that out. Uh, some of the largest cement construction materials company uh, originate from Thailand. So they will, you know, uh, be interested in what you have to say. Although we have to note that uh, every Southeast Asian market is a little different. Um, uh, and Thailand, the strength of the ecosystem, but also its uh, curse is that the conglomerates are near monopolies. So they have the power to invest and question you as, as winners, but they also have the power to compete with you because they have all the smartest people and they have all the money and the distribution. Um, so figuring out a game plan for that. And obviously uh, each market um, is either the same or a little different. Uh, in the Philippines, maybe each in each country, six to 20 families run the entire ecosystem. Um, the Philippines, even smaller number of families, uh, Thailand, um, obviously a little bit more. And Singapore, it's the, the Lee family uh, of, of the, the uh, prime minister. Um, and, and the government is, you know, Singapore incorporated. So um, run very efficiently. Uh, but if you make it and you get Temasek, the sovereign wealth fund under cap table, uh, the Sequoias and the... And recent horror whips and the lights will come uh, knocking at your door. So uh, we have specific game plan for each market. Um, and the idea is is to come uh, and spend some time here, uh, build a network, uh, figure out if uh, I think oh, with um, uh, I love the name German. So when, when I, I meet folks, um, uh, Germanic roots, uh, they usually have very expensive SaaS they want to sell. To the region, I have this incredibly high quality technology, uh, but it's really uh, expensive to deploy using expensive uh, specialist machinery. And I say, if you come to Southeast Asia, it's just not going to fly. You know, our ability, uh, the, the the price point that the corporates are willing to pay for, the purchasing power is much lower, uh, the scale that you need to do it is much bigger. Uh, but the financing model and sometimes the business model is different. Um, uh, so for an example, a lot of people don't like to pay for uh, software as a service um, because they're not used to that or you know they, they would try in every way they can to not pay. Um, but they might pay for some other things. Uh, for an example, that it's a very important software that allows them to make more money. Uh, or it's linked to um, your software allows uh, the brands to uh, be able to monetize better and accept payments from the customers or access to loans, cheap loans from Europe. Or uh, there's an innovative financing model where you uh, the, the, the corporates can use the software first and pay later based on usage, based on... Uh, you know, after a freemium trial, right? And then a lot of... Uh, 
you know, European uh, Western companies have a, a fixed model that this is the only way, and it doesn't work. E even Disney in Southeast Asia has a, this thing called Disney Hotstar. It's just like Disney Plus at a fraction of the price, just for the emerging markets. Doesn't have all the same content, but it has Korean drama, Indian, Malay, Indonesian drama. So if you're coming with an open mind and you want to build a model that works for the region, then yes. But if you say it has to be built in New Zealand uh, and uh, only New Zealand quality and only, and then you ship it. Um, I had this, this project where we wanted to ship uh, these office phone boots, um, you know, like the ones you see in uh, co-working spaces, insulated phone boots that you can do your Zoom call. It was going to come from Finland. And the Finnish guy said, it has to be Finnish wood and Finnish quality only. And then the furniture uh, tax was like 300%. I said, no, uh, it's got to come from China, man, because it's free. There's no tax. Uh, I know you don't want to build it because it's made in China, but it doesn't matter. You could even make it made in Thailand for all I care. But uh, nobody's going to buy because that, that phone booth would cost me an equivalent of a small car. And guess what? I wanted to do that business. Four years later, uh, you see it all online. People have copied the design quality, maybe 70, 80%. Doesn't insulate sound as nice, but gets the job done and at a fraction of the price. So uh, those, those Finnish guys uh, lost the market. Uh, and uh, yeah, they never took it seriously. Well, kia ora, um, AIM. Um, just in honour of the time, and also I know, AIM, you wanting to go on a run, um, and I'm sure yes. Jeffrey will be able to connect um, you and your co-founder, Pedro, is it? Um, to, to AIM and continue this conversation. So I just want to um, thank you, AIM, for taking this time and prioritising this session. Um, it's been a great corridor and conversation. And thank you to everyone here that joined us today. You can mm -hmm. find the recording on the EHF um, website to share with your peers if you wish to. Um, just a really quick um, uh, update as well is that we've got another live session next week on the Tuesday, 29th of um, August on um, demystifying early stage fun uh, fundraising avoiding common mistakes to get your first investor check with um, two other fellows. So um, please sign up. Um, I will close with a karakia uh, as we again transition away from the virtual space. So tuia i runga, tuia i raro, tuia i roto, tuia i waho, tuia i te here tangata, ka rongo te pō, ka rongo te ao, ti hei muri ora. Ngā mahi nui ka ki te ano. Kia ora. Thank you. And thank you so much.